Welcome engineers, my name is Travis IQ, and today we're talking about cybersecurity events, false positives, false negatives, and I suppose the good ones, true positive, true negatives. Let's go! Join me in the void as we discuss these cybersecurity event types. The first two event types that I'm going to talk about are the true positive and true negatives. These are kind of the easy ones, and I'm actually going to have this discussion in the context of security information and event management, or SEAMs. What is a SEAM? The security information and event management utilities. Examples of SEAMs would be things like Splunk, QRadar, ArcSight. Uh, another one would be Microsoft Sentinel. Actually, Sentinel, they say, is SEAM-like. But anyway, what these things do, what these utilities do, is they aggregate information and then allow you to correlate and identify events in mixed modal environments, network in the network, logging data from other devices, applications and database logs, right? And so they'll pull this information together and then make assertions from there. And so what, what a SEAM product would do then is would give you an event and it would say, hey, something was blocked at this time, at this date on this device, and for this reason. And if that block, if that blocked event was correct, then that's a true positive. A WAN facing firewall noticed a TCP connection attempt from an IP address range that had been blocked, a Russian IP address range for those of us here in the US, for example. And as a result, that traffic was blocked. That is a true positive. You had a firewall rule that said to block this traffic. It was blocked. It was blocked. And then the event management system notified you and showed you a positive event. Great, that is a true positive. The event occurred, it was notified, and that is a good thing. That's a true positive. Great, we agree with this. The next on our list here is a true negative. So you have a Thursday overnight crew and they are monitoring your Microsoft Sentinel seam like product and not to say that the likelihood of, you know, in a large environment, nothing occurring is pretty low. But let's say that when you do a changeover, the, what you communicate is minimal. And you say, hey, there wasn't any major events last night. Okay, there were no major events. What is, what that is, that's called a negative result, as opposed to the positive, positive result where there was an event. A negative result means there were no events or nothing was notified or identified as abstract or, or odd or blocked. Now, if this is true, this is a true negative result, so there was nothing identified as problematic, then that is also a good thing for us. When you, hand, when you conduct the changeover and you say, hey, there were no major events, and that is a true result, then that is a good thing for you. So a true positive means an event was logged noted, and if it was an intrusion prevention system, it was blocked. So that's a true event that was positive, that is good for us, that's fine. And then a true negative, nothing was identified, and nothing was blocked. And that is true, that's a true, that's a true statement about the, the infrastructure, that is good. Where we get to the discussion in cybersecurity that, that makes this job difficult is these. False, positive or, false positives are a type one error, or false negatives are a type two error. And so a false positive is a user attempted to log in to an account remotely at 9 p.m. on a Thursday night. That remote access was blocked. And then you say, Travis, that doesn't sound like a problem. Well, that user was a senior administrator. And that senior administrator was logging in at 9 p.m. on a Thursday night to try and do something that was related to their job function. But based upon either user and behavioral analytics, UEBA, right, or based upon some time of day and time of day restrictions, then that user was blocked. Well, that user should not have been blocked because they needed that access to do their job. That's a false positive. An event occurred and a result was was resulted from that event, but it shouldn't have been resulted in that way, right? The event occurred, yes, but should it have occurred? No, it shouldn't have. So that's a positive result that is false. These are not great for us. 
Now you might say, Travis, I mean, I'd rather have my intrusion prevention system and my seam logging this information and showing me these blocks. I'd rather have that infrastructure blocking more stuff and have to claw that back and say, hey, let's, let's dial back these time of day restrictions on senior staff. I agree with you. That's probably the case. So it's probably a better case to have more false positives than not, but I'll give you some examples in which the false positives can become an issue for sure. The bigger issue is a false negative or a type two error. This is, this is where you get into really difficult situations. An example of a false negative is you had an event occur, a malicious attacker was, was able to access a database that they should not have, or maybe even an internal user that wasn't supposed to access an internal database gained access to that internal database, whether they meant to or not maliciously, and nothing was flagged. And let's see, let's say that user wasn't even malicious. Let's just say they gained access to an internal database. They said, oh, I shouldn't be here, and then they left. Okay, that's still a false negative if nothing is flagged in your security information event management or, or by your IDS. That's still a problem. And so it's a really big problem if that user is malicious or if it's an external, if it's an external user conducting something malicious. If you remember the solar winds hack of several years ago now, that was a there was a false negative result in a lot of the IDS systems in the companies that were using SolarWinds, specifically the network management utility Orion, which was what had the malicious content embedded in it. And so the false negatives allowed these malicious users to be pervasive in these environments for months. That's a huge problem. So in this case, an event did occur. The event occurred and it was not flagged. That's a false negative. That's a big problem. Let's think about some of the context around why these would be such big issues. So I wanted to, I wanted to point out this, why these matter. Number one, too many false positives. I talk about this a lot in my courses, but I will tell you, if you are someone who is tasked with reviewing logs or reviewing SIEM events or reviewing IDS logs, and you have a ton of logs to review and the logs keep getting larger and larger and larger and you get backlogged, backlogged, get it? And you get backlogged. Now, does it even matter if that event occurred? It really doesn't matter if the event occurred, if no one's there or there's too many log entries for you to even figure it out. That's actually a strategy for uh, both pen testers and malicious users is to inundate the logs or to inundate the interfaces. You could use like a denial of service attack to obfuscate and say, hey, look at all this log in information here. Look at all these events over here. I'm actually going to attack this thing. And if you're savvy enough to be able to pull out this one event from all these events that I generated, good on you. But I think you're very unlikely to do that. But anyway, I digress. False positives can be a really big deal. And so it is important to minimize the occurrence of false positives. It's important to set the thresholds for logging to a point where the most important information is logged and noted so that you can analyze it. But it's also important not to set that threshold too high. And I have this discussion with junior engineers sometimes where I'm like, hey, your thresholds are so high that it's really difficult for you to pull out the most valuable information. And I'd rather you key in on the most valuable information than log every single thing and have to look at them all. And now that's not necessarily, logging might be the wrong context there than identifying every single thing. I'd like for you to log most or everything if you have the capacity to do so. And then I'd like you to identify or I'd like you to set the thresholds for your IDS to identify specific instances so that you can then go back as a as the person behind the scenes and analyze those instances. Now, I've kind of already given you the example of solar winds. Too many false negatives, critical threats go unnoticed, things like patching infrastructures and missed patches or software vulnerabilities or things like this. That's definitely a problem. And then more, more importantly is breaches going unnoticed. I'll tell a story here. I had a student in a class of mine many years ago in a network infrastructure class. And <clears throat> he said he was one of two or three network administrators for a very large infrastructure in the Midwest. And I said, hey, how did you end up here? If there's only two of you and you're here, how is that network infrastructure being ad administrated, right? And I said, you know, how did you get them to give you the time off? If, you, if you've been in these infrastructures as a security engineer or a network engineer, you know it's tough sometimes to get time off. There aren't that many people that know how to do what you can do. And the individual said to me, oh, actually, I caught an instance of a malicious user in our infrastructure. I saw some log entries that looked weird late at night, 
and I was on site late at night and opened up and turned on a monitor that was typically off on one of these machines that, that's you know headless essentially, right? And I saw the mouse moving around on the screen, right? And no one was there. No one else should have been logged into this infrastructure. I caught this and then they remediated it. And I had been asking for years for additional funding to go and do these things or to bring in tools. And they allowed me the time and the freedom to come here and take this course. So I had more knowledge now to help administer this infrastructure to secure it and to segment the network and some other things because it was a network infrastructure course. But yeah, it was all a result of these false negatives. And so what do we do? We balance these security measures. We have high sensitivity, but only high enough so that we see the most valuable things, right? And we have high specificity. So that's the other component. Only specific enough to pull out the inf information that we think is the most valuable. And that's what really makes you valuable as a security engineer, is to understand how to set these thresholds in your infrastructure. And then you might say, Travis, how do I set these thresholds in my infrastructure? It depends. Do you, are you a network administrator or security engineer for a series of car dealerships across the Southeast? Then maybe your security requirements are one thing. Are you a network administrator for a mobile device management solution for a hospital network? Then your thresholds are going to be at a different level. Are you a managed service provider that only manages services for one, 10 to 200 PCs or compute devices for small businesses? Well, then your thresholds are gonna be set probably lower than that hospital mobile device management engineer, right? But you as the engineer are going to be the one who is making those decisions and that's how you provide your value. I got a little off topic here in terms of you know, certification exam objectives, but I want you to know how to provide value as well. As is always the case, engineer, break stuff, have fun. We'll see you on the next one. We'll show some questions in the next video. Let's go.